In the beginning, he looks like another loser you'd see get stuffed into a locker. By the end, you realize he is one of the most complex heroes in cinematic history. McLovin went against every stereotype that a lead male role is supposed to be. He wasn't handsome. He wasn't physically fit. He wasn't charming. He wasn't funny. He was a dork. But his unwavering confidence and borderline delusion forced you to see him as nothing short of incredible. Choosing your own nickname is already bold, but purposely picking McLovin is so absurd, you have to respect it. Because of Christopher Mintz Plaza's perfect execution of this role, Superbad became one of the best coming-of-age comedies of all time. Unfortunately, McLovin was so iconic that he would forever be known as this character he played at 18 years old, preventing his legacy from exceeding beyond the nerdy organ donor from Hawaii. Christopher Mintz Plas was an ordinary kid raised in the Los Angeles suburbs. Although he was often casted the role of the nerd, Chris says this didn't reflect his reality. I don't do it as much as I used to, but when I'm free and get the chance, I play basketball all the time. I know the movies I've been in make me look like a nerd, but I was never like that. It's common for Southern California teens to consider acting early on since they are right next to Hollywood. When he got to high school, Chris started attending acting and improv classes and even joined the improv comedy team. During his senior year he caught wind of a movie audition a few of his acting buddies were trying for and figured he'd casually send in some headshots from his 2006 camera phone. Judd Apatow and Seth Rogen thought Chris had the perfect nerdy look, so they invited him for an audition with the rest of the cast. Hey man, McLovin sounds old, okay? Come on, the chicks are digging it. You kill me? Are you kidding me, dude? Fogel, under what circumstances would you ever show that thing to a chick? Dude, she could totally ask to see my ID. <laughs> I don't know, I could just show it to her. <laughs> oh my god. I don't, I don't believe this. I can't even, this says you're f***ing 25. Why don't you put 21 on your ID? You're f***ing predictable, Seth. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Listen, ass face. All right, every day, hundreds of kids go into the liquor store with their fake IDs saying they're 21. Just how many 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds you think there are in this town? It's called strategy, okay? <laughs> this was Chris's very first movie audition, and he perfectly played the role of the overconfident high school loser. But immediately after Chris's audition, Jonah Hill was like, not that guy. Superbad was a film written by Seth Rogen and his childhood best friend, Evan Goldberg. The plot loosely resembles their real experiences as teenagers. I wrote it in high school for the most part, so I mean, something would happen to us Monday, we'd write it in on Tuesday. Uh, our whole goal for writing it was to make a very realistic portrayal of our high school experience. So there's one part of the movie where Michael Sarah is kind of explaining what he did the previous weekend, and then they're shotgunning beers, and then they're at a, one of their parents' parties, and they go to a strip club, and then and then Evan pukes all over Seth, and like that night literally happened. Now, what unfolds in Superbad is definitely not realistic. However, the basic idea of the plot resembles an accurate look into the life of an American high schooler in the early 2000s. Seth and Evan are about to graduate and go to different colleges, and they want to make their last summer together memorable. Seth constructs a plan to buy alcohol for a party in order to impress girls they have crushes on, but they have an ulterior motive. They are trying to sleep with these girls so they can lose their virginities before college. The only problem is they are not old enough to buy alcohol. Luckily, their friend Fogel may have just saved the day as he acquired a fake ID to purchase the alcohol. At lunch, I'm going to the same place Mike Snyder went to pick up my brand new fake ID. Check out, check out here, fake ID, fake ID, outside. In the film, Seth and Fogel have some disdain for each other, which was also the case behind the scenes. But before we get into Chris and Jonah's real life beef, have you ever Googled your name and seen yourself on one of those strange sites that has way too much information about you? I'd rather have that stuff not available to just anyone who's looking for it. Data brokers are making tons of money selling your information to robocallers and spammers. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor. Aura. Aura can find the data brokers that are sharing your information. These brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to. However, they make it very difficult to do so. That's where Aura comes in and submits opt-out requests for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link, aura.com slash patrickcc. Aura has many other features to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see. Instead of having multiple different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, parental controls, password management, identity theft, and more, Aura has them all in one one place, and you get everything for one affordable price. I personally like how I can have all these features in one organized app. Let Aura protect your information and keep you safe online. You can let people continue to exploit you and profit off your private information, or you can go to aura.com slash patrickcc to start your two-week free trial. Link is in the description. 
Thanks, Aura. Seth Rogen remembers the animosity between the two. Jonah effing hated him, says Rogen. He was all over Jonah's lines. Completely disrespectful of the process, probably due to a lack of experience. Then Jonah said, Chris just immediately shut me down. So combative. I was really annoyed because this guy wouldn't let me say anything. He was, like, uh, irritated by him. I think he felt that Chris was like kind of getting the better of him comedically, stopping Jonah, like like kind of like blocking Jonah's like funny jabs. In a feat of writing genius, Rogan realized that Jonah and Chris butting heads made their dialogue so much funnier. I don't like you at all. It's okay, I don't like you. Their constant bickering and insults perfectly represented a typical teenage boy's friendship. Rogan and Goldberg felt that there were no high school movies that were really capturing what teens were experiencing. No teenagers talking about drinking and getting laid, in the foulest terms possible. So we wrote one, basically. Superbad can be credited with popularizing raunchy terms into regular vernacular. It was the first movie to use the term finger fuck, which would go on to be used in rap songs by Tyler the Creator, Lil Wayne, Logic, Migos, and countless others. DTF, or down to fuck, was a catchphrase that Jonah Hill randomly said while he was improvising that ended up becoming a popular slang term. She looked me in the eyes and said, Seth, mom is making a pubie salad and I need some Seth's own dressing. She's DTF, she's down to fuck, man. P and V G. she wants to fuck. Man. But easily the most iconic word, phrase, or name from the film is McLovin. Seth and Evan said on Reddit that they came up with the name McLovin in the original script that they wrote as 13 year olds. In the film, the character's name is Fogel, which as many of you know is the geek that tries hard to be cool. Gangsters, what's up guys? But when purchasing his fake ID, he can choose any name he wants. So he decided to pick the most badass name he could think of. It's flawless here, dude. Check it out, look. <laughs> McLovin? Man, why did you, why does it say McLovin on it? Well, they let you pick any name you want when you get down there. Fogel's dead set on McLovin being a great name. Combine that with his witty jabs at Seth, and he totally shifted the audience's feelings towards him. I mean, it's up to you, Fogel. This guy's either gonna think, here's another kid with a fake ID, a 25-year-old Hawaiian organ donor. Okay, so what's it gonna be? I am McLovin. McLovin becomes an audience surrogate here. They relate to the feeling of being proud of an idea, but having someone like Seth constantly trying to bring them down. McLovin can't even wear a vest without Seth attacking him. Despite the constant hate, McLovin wants to be the boss, the hero, the man they can rely on to get the alcohol for the boys and the girls. But that's not how Seth sees it. Seth treats him like the fall guy. If McLovin gets caught with a fake ID, Seth and Evan won't get in trouble, and they can come up with another plan to win over the girls. I think I think this is a major reason why his character became so beloved. Despite being treated like crap, all of the stakes of this mission are riding on McLovin. He is taking on multiple different archetypes that are quintessential to the progression of the plot. The cops then arrive at the liquor store and he has to be caught, right? I mean, surely they don't think his real name is McLovin and that this has got to be a fake ID. But no. They think his name is actually cool. They don't view him as a nerd, but rather an interesting organ donor from Hawaii, which sets up the rest of the movie for McLovin to just be unapologetically himself. Hey, did she say we're gonna get to like shoot somebody or something? Oh God, I wish. Nah, it's probably just some lame house party. We'll drop you off after, is that cool? Yeah, man, let's show these is how we roll. And despite him getting caught up with the cops, he still comes through with the alcohol, completing the original mission he set out to accomplish. Even Seth had to admit that McLovin is the man for that. We made it, we made it with the booze and everything, we made it. Uh. Well, this, I can't believe you still have the liquor. It's awesome. Yeah, man, I told you the idea would work. I fooled those cops. I'm McLovin, Woo! I am McLovin! As if the story couldn't get any better for McLovin, he is the only one out of the three that ends up getting laid. And since he was 17 years old during the film, his mother had to be on set watching her son perform his first sex scene. I got a boner. <laughs> Good. And why not just put the cherry on top? He gets dragged out of the party fighting the cops which impressed all of his peers, then ends the movie guns blazing. Break yourself, fool! With all the cards stacked against him, McLovin saved the day, got the girl, and was a total badass while doing it. With a relatively small budget of $20 million, Superbad surpassed everyone's expectations, earning $33 million on its opening weekend and eventually grossing $300 million when including revenue from DVD sales. The day after the movie premiered, Christopher went from a nobody to a superstar. Literally the next day after it came out, 
I went into the the Habit, which is a burger joint down here in LA, and like people screamed at me from across the hall, McLovin, and chased me down, which was very alarming wow. at age 18. Yeah, and very surreal and kind of cool. Uh, you know, I probably felt like I was the Beatles or something back then. He told People Magazine, "It was very alarming for a 17-year-old person. I was trying to figure out who I was as a human being at the time, and then to have millions of people knowing you as McLovin was very intense." Mince Plaza's performance earned him a nomination at the MTV Movie Awards for Best Newcomer. Superbad was an instant classic, and McLovin was a McIcon. The hip-hop community loved McLovin. Wiz Khalifa could be credited with being the first rapper to name drop him in his 2007 track, Be Easy, where he says, Yeah, the young and super bad. You can call me McLovin. He was mentioned in quite possibly the biggest hip-hop collaboration of all time. In the 2009 track, Forever, featuring Drake, Kanye West, Lil Wayne, and Eminem, Kanye says, Super bad chicks giving me McLovin. In Kid Cudi and Ye's collaboration, Erase Me, they hired Chris to perform as the drummer in the music video. Ironically, rappers' images are the antithesis of McLovin. They are typically seen as smooth-talking, womanizing, stylish, and all-around cool people. But as hip-hop grew into the most popular genre in the world, countless rappers glorifying McLovin made him this larger-than-life figure. A quick search through Genius and you will find McLovin being referenced in lyrics by just about every rapper you can think of. Chance the Rapper, Lil Pump, Tyga, Logic, 21 Savage, Megan Thee Stallion, Rich the Kid, Migos, the list goes on forever. In a 2009 interview with Jonah Hill, he told MTV that he and Eminem were friends. Eminem says his favorite movie is Superbad, ever, of all time. He said if there was an award for best movie ever, he thinks Superbad should win. He quotes all the scenes to me. A viral YouTube sketch titled The Truth Behind Trapaholic's Voice helped certify McLovin and hip-hop even further. Chris is seen delivering some of the most iconic hip-hop vocal drops of all time. Real trap shit. Trapaholics. We make it look easy. Walk with your boys. Damn, son, where'd you find this? The video spread like wildfire, and even sparked a little challenge of people trying to recreate their version of the drops. Now, the Trapaholics vocal drops date way back to the early 2000s, but there were some people who genuinely believed Chris was the voice. Even the McLovin fake ID became a recognizable piece of history. In 2021, Blake Griffin wore a pair of basketball shoes designed around the ID, and thousands of replica cards still get sold every month on Amazon. Chris was stamped in pop culture as McLovin. He was a beloved icon, but as you can imagine, this made it very difficult for him to outshine the legacy of that role. Immediately after Superbad, Chris got a ton of visibility from Jimmy Kimmel when he was invited to do a comedic music video sketch that was jam-packed with A-list stars. Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Robin Williams, Brad Pitt, and McLovin. He quickly secured another nerd role in the comedy film Role Models, alongside Paul Rudd and Sean William Scott, which generated nearly $100 million at the box office, then followed that up with a tertiary role in year one that just barely broke even in the box office. But his second most successful primary role was in the 2010 film Kick-Ass, which was about a nerdy high school student who decides to be a superhero even though he has no powers, training, or reason to even be a hero. Chris played the superhero Red Mist, and the film was a huge box office his hit, earning about $100 million. Throughout the 2010s, he was a go-to tertiary character for comedy films. Pitch Perfect, This Is The End, The To-Do List, Neighbors 1 and Neighbors 2 were all big films that he can be seen in. However, it became clear that Christopher was being typecast in Hollywood, which is essentially when someone plays the same general character in every film. No matter what movie, Chris was always the nerd or the skinny weakling who isn't taken very seriously. And although some of the films were successful, none of them came close to eclipsing the domination of Superbad, which made every character he portrayed look like a lesser version of McLovin. People didn't even refer to Christopher Mintz Plas as his real name. They would say, oh, that movie has McLovin in it. I met someone at the Celtics game that's like, hey McLovin, I'm like, yeah, what's going on? My name's Chris. And he's just like, I'm calling you McLovin. I don't care. I don't care. I'm calling you this. And I'm like, all right. However, there are some benefits to being typecast. If you are in the right genre, which for Chris is comedy, you can easily get consistent work. Every time there is a goofy or raunchy comedy being made, Chris is seen as a viable option for a character. This has kept him very active, doing a major production every year for well over a decade. Like his most recent movie, Honor Society, is a high school teen comedy, but instead of being the nerdy student, he is the dorky teacher. He was also able to successfully enter the world of voice acting. DreamWorks Studios' animated film, How to Train Your Dragon, casted Chris 
introduced as Fishlegs Ingerman, who is the resident dragon nerd and statistics guru. The film grossed $500 million, which was DreamWorks' highest grossing film outside of the Shrek series. Not only did he get multiple years of consistent work due to portraying Fishlegs, the film's success gave him a wide open door of opportunity as a career voice actor. He voiced Alvin in Paranorman, another $100 million success. He voiced King Gristle in DreamWorks' Trolls, a $350 million box office smash. He also earned a lead voice role in Blark and Son, which is a highly rated Comedy Central animated series with a cult fanbase. But the other benefit of being typecast is that roles don't require much prep work. He shows up, performs as the character he always does with small changes, and collects a paycheck. This gives him a lot of free time to hone in on other passions, like music. Ploss invested some of his super bad earnings in a drum kit to play in his band, the Young Rapscallions. However, after eight years and only one EP, the band came to an end when the bassist decided to quit, but he didn't give up. Chris started a band with his childhood friends called Main Man. The indie alternative band grew up together in California. They found their sound by combining indie slash psychedelic rock with surf and turf funk, which is a common sound from the Southern Cali area. Main Man has released two EPs titled Mistaker in 2017 and another in the same year titled Social Security Party. The band was never really able to get off the ground and once the pandemic hit, that was kind of the end of their dream. But Chris's passion for music and performing is far too strong to quit. By mid-2021, he started playing in the band Bankweller and is still touring with them to this day. While some might think Christopher Mintz Plas's career is lackluster since he was not really ever able to surpass the legacy of McLovin, others look at his career as a massive success. Being able to land multiple roles in TV shows, movies, and animated films every year since 2007, and on top of that, touring with a successful band and getting engaged to his longtime girlfriend. He is only in his mid-30s and likely has a long, consistent career ahead of him. He might even be able to outdo his 17-year-old role. But the best part is, he doesn't hate that we all love McLovin. He is honored. I guess I haven't been called McLovin in a year. I kind of miss it now. I kind of, oh, my ego kind of Don't say that. Don't. But now, you know, I take it, I think it's a sense of endearment. Like, it's cool that if I were to walk outside and someone said it, it's cool that they remember it 14 years later and still want to talk about it. Who 